All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you. This is uh, this is the next next uh, event here for the workflow and automation hug. Uh, it, you know the oh, the agenda for today. Uh, so it's pretty in like five minutes, I'm going to shut up. I promise. Uh, but we're going to kind of go over the introductions about Chris and myself. Uh, we're kind of get into really the meat of this of listening to your leads. Uh, what Chris has uh, coined <laughs> as the GHS AVM crew uh that will kind of walk through and kind of you know maybe your tools for that and then really building your growth strategy and then finally like i said we'll get into the q and a uh section um and so please make sure you put those questions in there so quick introductions um so my name is alex uh i am the co-founder and vp of marketing of sales at beacons point um Fun facts about me. Um, that is my, well, one thing, that is my dog in there. And he does win like most emo dog of the year. He's got like eyeliner around his eyes and he always, he's like the happiest dog, but he looks sad in photos. Um, so I Can don't I really like sushi. Fan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he's more of a 30 seconds to Mars, please. Um, I used to work on a show called Deli's Catch that was crab fishing in Alaska. Uh, I'm a HubSpot certified trainer and my favorite taco, I know I said shredded beef, but I also do like a good Baja fish taco. Um, and, you know, Beacons Point, we're an inbound agency, Platinum, Platinum Solutions partner with HubSpot. We really work with a lot of tech and software companies. Um, you know, our sweet spot is content, video, and HubSpot. Um, so would love to talk with people about that if you have any questions. Uh, but I'm going to really hand it over to the master himself, uh, Chris <laughs> Growth Marketing. Uh, they've really put a big emphasis on on ABM and sales automation. So, Chris, welcome and thank you. Thank you. I'm just excited to finally be able to co-lead a webinar with you, Alex the Infamous. So, I am Chris Nault uh, on LinkedIn. You can find me as Christopher. Uh, I do prefer Chris. I am the founder of Growth Marketing Firm. <laughs> My fun facts. Uh, I am a big believer that rugby is the best sport in the world and the only one I really pay attention to. I am an Eagle Scout. I do fundraise on the side for five different nonprofits, and I live in Monterey, California. If you have not visited, definitely add that to your list. So growth is all about ABM and CMS and letter combinations. Uh, we are also a Platinum Solutions partner. We work in manufacturing SaaS and a lot of... Uh, B2B, uh, demand gen, HubSpot websites, and we've won a couple of awards on our advertising, marketing, and automation skill sets. I too am recovering from the uh, seasonal cold, <laughs> so sorry for the occasional cough. And are you ready to listen to your leads? So really this is all about, ooh, and let me find my place on here. How do you listen to your leads? So. First, we need to understand how do they communicate, where do they communicate, how do they learn, and where do they learn about new products and services, and where are they most confident in how they communicate. And I can tell you now that Zoom meeting or on a demo is not it. So this is kind of working around the problem of, besides the demo where you get that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime, how are you able to generate human conversations. So first, where, how do they communicate? Obviously online, with their phone, with their phone via text. And then of course we have email. So we, this is pretty much the same for all industries. Now I'm not going to suggest that texting or even emailing or uh, calling people is the same for all sales strategy, but there's something that we need to be cognizant of for sure. And where do they learn? Also online, also on their phone. Also, well, maybe text is kind of odd, but definitely email. We also have for this area, uh, trade industry publications. Makes a lot of sense to me. I'm sure you all can kind of see where this is going. And where are they most confident? Online on their phone, texting, emailing. And I have one that's not listed here and that is talking to somebody that they trust or someone in an industry. So 
if we want to sell to our deal customers, how do you think we should communicate with the three of them? I want to give you a second to put any of your guesses into the chat pane. Crower pigeon is um, not for my particular customers, but I think it's worth a shot. All right, everybody. We're talking online. We're talking on the phone. We're talking via text. And we're talking via email. Any questions so far? This is really the setup to the, how do we listen to our leads? So the problem is you already know how to solve your customer's problem, but you have not been introduced. That's the hardest part of this sales process, right? We, as an agency, as a manufacturer, uh, we have a customer right now. They have a very specialized, very expensive uh, manufacturing piece. It helps with uh, stucco. And they know that stucco companies need this component, but they have no idea other than having their salespeople get on the phone and call numbers and directories on how to get their solution in front of their customer. So this is one way to do it. Stand outside of your customer's door, wave the boom box. I'm gonna introduce another way. And that's taking your pre-existing HubSpot system and adding some of these uh, friends of the family, if you will, to help on the attract side, as well as the engage side. And while we're focusing for that portion for this conversation, it can, all of these tools can be used to help with the delight portion as well. Oh, and sorry, William, yeah, trade shows have definitely been a good one. Definitely been a good one. I'd kind of put that into that trade publications. All right, now I want to meet you to meet my team my virtual team at growth. First, Apollo.io. So this is our kind of alternate to Zoom info. <clears throat> they offer the buyer's intent as well. But for us, this is really how once you identify your, your perfect customer profile, this is where we go and we start building company and contact list. This data that you get is going to make basically be the blueprint that your sales team is using for outreach. We're going to go into detail with all these. My second favorite, and not in any particular order, is Rollworks. I love Rollworks. So I've been a Google partner and Facebook partner for, uh, I believe the program's been around for a decade. Typically, when you advertise, you have to advertise to everybody. There's some segmentation that you can do on the front end, but you're still casting a very wide net. With Rollworks, we take the contact information from Apollo, and then we drop those ads to those specific companies. Kixie is another one of my favorites. So when you're scaling outreach, and I mentioned the manufacturer is picking up the phone and calling people, Kixie is a HubSpot integration that handles your calls and your text at scale. My favorite part is the level of reporting you get. Everyone's famous, favorite, I feel like this is a software top 10, maybe top five for salespeople. We've got LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Who here is currently a LinkedIn Sales Navigator paid seat. Oh, Vicky, that's awesome. Anybody else Sales Navigator aficionados? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, if you, we'll talk a little bit about the HubSpot integration and raise. Thank you, Alex. Uh, William, we'll talk about the, the kind of here shortly. And then this is one of the newer additions to our ABM tech stack, and this is brandgen.io. So this was uh, founded by a HubSpot partner. Really, really cool software to, when we're talking about advertising and those trade publications. So we're going to go a little heavier into each of the tools. So Apollo.ir is Apollo We specifically use this tool for BDRs and marketing coordinators. Uh, we use this to uh, grab our company and contact list. You're able to sort through industry company size, employee count, revenue. But one of my favorite tools is the technology tool as well as keywords. So if we go back into that example of the uh, needing to sell into stucco companies, we can start with a uh, USA over 5 million or over 10 million list for construction. And then we can start dwindling it down with keywords to specifically stucco or wall construction companies. So you can use this for your pre-existing contact list. 
let's say you're already working off of some sort of either pre-created list or your own HubSpot data, you want to drag it in and find more about the people that you're already looking to communicate with. This is a really great tool. You simply import your uh, contact list, you do a little formatting. And then we all know that HubSpot, it, the, the power is that it's real communication with your real engaged contacts. Now, when we're on the awareness side, sometimes you may need a tool for outreach. I do not recommend doing that inside of HubSpot. And if you were to outreach to some contact, uh, this would be my recommendation for the tool. Uh, similar to HubSpot, uh, you can build sales sequences and also tie in LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And again, list building, that's what this tool is all for. Any questions on Apollo before I switch into Rollworks? All right. All right, now we're gonna talk about Rollworks. So this is really great. So now we are talking about the companies that we wanna work with. We pulled this list in Apollo and now we want to make sure that our ads are running in front of these people on their IPs. So they, they use their own AI software to identify the IPs that are coming out of this, these company computers. And that allows you, the advertiser, to place your ads in front of your target customer. One of my second favorite things about Apollo is its ability to build lookalike audiences. Now, placing ads with a generic message like and we're going to keep going back to this manufacturer conversation. So they sell one of their products is a machine for stucco users. So in Apollo, we thought we build a list of companies and contacts that are relevant to stucco. We drop them into Rollworks, and then we have ads fire with their machine with language that speaks specifically to stucco people. Now they also sell a different set of products for the fireproofing industry. In a similar example, we pull a list of their companies inside of Apollo, create them as a se separate export, and we import them into Rollworks. And now we can place a different ad with a different graphic and different languages pointing to different landing pages or microsites specifically for that fireproofing customer. Now, most companies have a few different fire personas and a few different types of companies that they target and that's really the benefit of Rollworks is you can separate these out into campaigns, define which one are performing the best and obviously invest more heavily in the ones that are outperforming the others. Another great portion is the automated tasks that can be assigned as engagement with your ads spikes for a particular account. It'll ping your sales reps and let them know that they are um, hot to trot or at least that the engagement is heavy and that allows Will Davidson from Growth to give you a call, shoot you an email and say, hey, based on this intent data, I can tell that you all are at least having internal conversations. Do you have any questions that I might be able to answer for you? My favorite thing about Rollworks, although it is a subscription-based software company, is we have found that our customers save 20 to 30% on their annual ad budget quite simply because they reallocate the same initial dollars as they would without Rollworks. But with Rollworks, we're only firing off ad spend, right? Based off of the ads clicked. So while ads are being clicked at a higher rate, they're so much more targeted that you end up saving, a night, especially if you're using like 5,000 plus ad budgets per month, you're looking at a solid 20 to 30% with your ads, which in most cases opens up an entirely new opportunity to add a advertising channel that you may not have previously had budgeted for. Any questions about Apollo? Um, it, it does a bit. Um, William has a question. Does Rollworks support pro pro programmatic? Um, I feel like I would like a, just a little bit more clarity on how you, what you're looking for in that question. You mind just maybe elaborating a little bit more? I mean, we, we treat, all of our conversations in that sort of way. Let's, we'll open the floor at the end of this and um, you can obviously go through all the popular ones. So you can run your LinkedIn ads on there and you can run your Google ads on there. Um, we use brand gen when we're talking specific um, industry-based 
IPs. William, we'll open it up to Q&A at the end of this. I'd love to talk more about that. So the next tool we're gonna to talk about is Kixie. This one's really, really great. So what I like about them over an air call or an alternative SMS phone call company is it's built inside the HubSpot platform. It gives you a more clear relationship with the works that your sales reps are doing from call count, uh, recording messages. You can easily build your workflow and sequent outreach using the Kixi tools, which is hands down my favorite. Well, on a customer service end, as far as software goes, the team at Kixi is incredibly hands-on. So we build partnerships with any softwares that we recommend, so that way we truly are experts. With Kixi, they are so helpful. We, more so than how does this product work for you, they can go in real time and build these campaigns out for you. And like, it's not a difficult process to ask for help with Kixi. And it's, it really sets them apart. They have a really awesome dialer. So it calls up to 10 numbers at once. Um, previous iterations of Chris was not a believer in outbound. As you can see, I have certainly been converted. Um, I've seen some incredible conversations come out of cold calling um, and now, here I am talking about it. I would have never thought that two years ago. And then I've already mentioned big, big value add for Kixi is that HubSpot reporting. If you're managing a team of salespeople, you really need to listen to their calls, see what's working, see what's not working. Um, strongly recommend. And for any of these platforms, if you're interested in doing a demo or learning more, of course, I'm going to be available to answer questions, uh, not only today, but in the future. Everyone's favorite, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Prior to me hopping on this, does anybody have any Kixi conversations? Is anybody doing cold phone call outreach? Do you have people picking up phones and calling? I find this is pr pretty common in manufacturing, but I'm also really impressed seeing software other than <laughs> Seamless or Zoom Info, who I know are incredibly persistent with their phone calls. Uh, software companies, huge opportunity here to connect with people, start real conversations. That's awesome, Alex. It's great. Again, I, many moons ago, we were an inbound agency too. And as our, our customers' needs changed, we found uh, we had to change. Oh, that's great. Good job, Vicki. She's saying that she used sequences in both Apollo and HubSpot, along with cold direct mailing. Uh, are you using Sendoso for the direct mail? They're pretty awesome. You haven't seen them. They're on my not on my list on here, but here they are and here. Okay, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. What makes this great? Can't say everybody, but so many people are on LinkedIn. And when you are looking at a contact inside of HubSpot, what better way to learn more about them and the people that they're associated with than inside your HubSpot account? The custom object that comes along with the LinkedIn Sales Navigator is incredible, incredible. So you get that contact enrichment inside your HubSpot account. You get communication enrichment within HubSpot which I find to be really great. It suggests things, talking points that you can bring up, really powerful tool. And then similar to Apollo, you can build contact lists. So with so many tools allowing you to build lists, a uh, little pro hack is to use the same naming convention per campaign or per ABM strategy. For example, we would recommend using the category maybe some company size, two or three indicators. And if you're using campaigns in numerical order, or if you're using it based off of date or a quarter per year, some sort of uh, timestamp. So category stamp, timestamp, that'll allow you to um, add and navigate through your different outreach list a lot easier than not having a naming convention, which causes a lot of problems very quickly. Okay, the newest kid on the block is brandgen.io. 
what I love about this is this is, allows you to skip the step of hiring an ad agency. And as in form, I guess formally we were an ad agency. This was a real struggle for our customers, which is going straight to the source. If you needed advertising SaaS publications, they're using Google-based uh, programmatic ads. And this allows us to go straight in, go through their library and purchase direct. There's no subscription fee for brand gen. I think they take a processing fee of 5% of your ad spend, um, dollar for dollar. Saves most of our customers 20, 30%. The service side on brand gen is great. They're still a really new company. Um, they're part of the HubSpot Accelerator program. This is a really good time for you to, if this is something that you're looking into, a really great opportunity to kind of get in while you have direct access to not only, not the decision makers per se, but the development team. Like they're very active, want to know what's working and what's not working. I find that to be incredibly helpful. That's right. And there's really no minimum. So thanks, Alex. As for Galen at BrandGen. Any questions on brandgen.io ad placement in trade publications and programmatic? Okay, so for complete transparency, we have been uh, kind of blown away with the cost of brandgen.io. I am not an expert in their reporting because we basically drop ads in their channel and let it rip and we see the um, where the traffic is coming from on our HubSpot reporting side and almost ignore the cost because we're running 500, 2,000, 2,500 dollar a month campaigns inside of these areas. So William, excellent question. I am not an expert in that area, but I am happy, happy to connect you to the powers that be. Um, so for us, a little less on the brand gen side and a little more, oh, 48 clicks came from this platform that we were advertising on. That's a high enough number for us to keep it going and not bad at night. Any questions so far? I feel like I am really lapping myself as far as time. So we, we definitely have opportunity. So here's a little bonus. All of these tools not only can be used to attract new customers, they're all fantastic tools for re-engagement, your follow-ups, your renewals. And so when we're looking at the cost of these different platforms on the sales side, it's certainly worth looking at on the service side that there's an added value as well. All right, so honestly, that's, that's it. I wanted to give you all the, the grand tour of our account-based marketing platform. And I would love to answer any questions that you all have. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in there now. If everybody wants to add some in there, um, I kind of have a question that maybe you can kind of, maybe we can help kind of spearhead some thoughts. <laughs> um, can you can you walk through like a use case or like a like an example of how you set this up or like what what types of companies is it good for? What types of products? Um, you know, you don't have to go into like every single step from getting things set up, but really, like, how do you use these tools and how? What's like the process to get the outcome, desired outcome? Because looking at this, I'm, you know, from somebody who maybe hasn't started it yet, there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of processes, there's a lot of strategy and probably each of them. Um, so curious to know how you would approach it uh, if you were kind of just starting this and, and like a use case of why that would, how that would work. Sure. So, I mean, that's really how we ended up adding the service offering at growth was we started discovering some of these tools individually, but it didn't tell the full story of how we could take advantage of them. In fact, all of the platforms um, ha have a gap. 
And so we had to spend an incredible amount of time working with the different platform tools to figure out what's the common language to use so people understand how you can use this. And that's why I put the tools in a certain order. So at Growth, we offer a kind of a 30-day workshop where we go through a sales and marketing alignment meeting. So obvious or maybe not so obvious, you're going to need to know your ideal customer profile. Now, you can have more than one of these, but that's where we break out the what industry, company size revenue, company size employees, um, if your stats, perhaps what technology that you're, they should have in order for you to sell to or should have as if they're a competitor. Keywords are also a really great functionality. I mentioned earlier that in the example of looking at construction companies, but wanting to hone in on wall construction or stucco, how that eliminates the or drops the list down incredibly. You're going to want to try to find areas that are so specific that you're looking at 500, 1,000 companies at a time. One, so that way you're not creating a list that's so big you'll never clear it. Two, the real power with communicating with your customers isn't to stop at one contact per company. You really are going to want it to reach out to multiple contacts. So at Growth View, three and a half per company. So that's your starting phase, right? You know your ICP, you build this contact list. The next thing you're going to do is say, hey, marketing team, we need some graphics. We need some copy. Clone our landing page template. Make it resonate with this customer, uh, this specific ICP. Drop those assets into RollWorks. Immediately start uh, working on your second or third list so you can get three different groupings, campaigns going inside the RollWorks platform. Now, for us, the next hop is the communication with the sales team. So that's why we drop in Kixty. Kixi, um, in parallel with LinkedIn Sales Navigator and email outreach, those are your three messages to do the one-to-one -one connection. And then brand gen uh, is having that more specific and being the newest of our uh, team members, uh, it pretty much click and go with them. Drop the graphic, drop the URL you want it to point to, pick your publications, pick your budget, and it does everything else for you. Was that thorough? Yeah. Actually, uh, I want to go. Uh, I want to go to to William's question. And uh, William, if you'd like, we can also bring you off camera. You, we can discuss this. But his question is uh, around RollWorks. Um, what ad networks are supported? Google, Bing, social, real time bidding. Like what? Maybe talk more about RollWorks. And and again, um, uh, I can William, I can bring you off. Uh, camera too, if you want to discuss. Oh, so Come on good. in. All right. So as far as AdWords go, it does all the big players. Um, you get Google, you get Bing. I don't know if we drop Facebook ads, Instagram ads into our role works or not, to be completely honest. I feel terrible for having that gap. Um, and real-time bidding, it still runs off of that. I think, honestly, that the architecture, they're part of the AdWorks team. It's one of their sister companies. And so I know a lot of their a lot of their behind-the-scenes computing is Google-based, if I'm not speaking correctly there. Could you tell me a little bit more about your use case for ad placement? Who are you targeting? Yeah. What's that? Who are you targeting? Uh, we're targeting kind of our clients as you we have a uh, an industrial base being here in north carolina um we do work with a number of manufacturers and industrial suppliers um so it's definitely b2b in that space we had hired somebody from another agency to help build out a our paid media department and expand it beyond just you know basic google and bing ads uh he got us into some of the um i think it's the sell side platforms like stack adapt and norex and diginus is the latest one that he's um he had set up uh, but he has taken another job and now we're trying to figure out how do we build this department out because yeah you know, clearly as you know you're pointing out advertising is a key part of your strategy here to make it easier to sell and we see the same opportunity 
um, but we're now trying to hire somebody in and don't we want to keep it simple and it sounds like what you're using i've heard real works before it sounds like it's doing the job for you um, yeah, it's, it's, i wonder if it's i i wonder if we can do what we promised to do for our existing clients with that platform i haven't heard so, some of the platforms that you mentioned but it would certainly be i mean i'd be happy to, to give you a demo or hook you up with one of their reps for more specific um q a they're very knowledgeable okay. um it seems like that we may i don't know I, I, it seems like it would be the right thing you're trying to place targeted ads in front of a targeted group of people yeah it's a it's and then you're, i'm a, obviously you're a hubspot customer otherwise you wouldn't be here Yep. Cool. Yeah, it works great. And there's this new, I'm not sure if it's out of beta yet or if it's still in beta for HubSpot. It's the customer journey visual tool. This this adds a lot of uh, depth to that feature, which I'm thankful for. So though my contact it, information will be available. I'm definitely happy to point you in the right direction. Another question? Is the, how was Rollworks interfacing with HubSpot? I know HubSpot has some of that um, ad tracking capability in there. Is that, does Rollworks interfere with any of that? <coughs> Played nicely with it? Played nicely. I will say they just launched a, a bunch of upgrades to the integration that make it play much nicer. You, okay. there, it felt a little bit disconnected prior to, basically you kind of double checking information stacks. Mm -hmm. But with the updates they made, it makes life a lot easier for our marketing coordinators. Okay. Rather, I'd love know, to talk not, about having to, having to report twice is not fun. No, no, that's why we got in HubSpot to begin with, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we want to to HubSpot should be considered an all-on-one, not an all-in-one software. So vetting the right tools has been incredibly important for us. And where there are partnerships available, we take that option so we can get the extra training and have direct access. Rollworks is one of those platforms that we're a partner of. To know. Yeah. Are there, uh, Chris, are there some other platforms, uh, you know, equivalent to Rollworks that you've experimented with that, you know, how did you land on Rollworks as the, the solution for, for ads? Well, one, we've been a Google and Facebook partner for as long as they've had the partnerships. That's been our go-to. And I would say, if you listen to some of my recordings two years ago, I specifically say if you're going to advertise within the Google Display Network, you should be building your ads inside Google. Um, I can't recall some of the other ad placement tools we've used in the last year before we led to, like landed on Rollworks, but I do know like AdRoll and some of their other tools were really great, and they've done an excellent job of community building around those as well. So when Rollworks launched a few years ago, um, we had our eye on it, but it wasn't quite there from the HubSpot integration side. It was a powerful tool, but didn't live with the ecosystem. Six months that started to change. Three months ago, uh, they made a huge improvement. And then this, we kind of been waiting for this latest uh, drop of integration updates to land. And thankfully, <laughs> so we can start screaming about Rollworks officially now. Why well, talk about the ones that didn't make the cut, though, you know? <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, people spend a lot of time vetting tools because, I mean, you got to find the right one. And it's it's often going to decide other parts of your process. And, you know, I know there's good tools for specific reasons. Um, so we're just kind of curious your your thought process on that. Uh, for us, so it's you. You, UX is very important. The service side, I mean, HubSpot spoil this all, I think, with... Um, creating that expectation where customer support can answer questions quickly, even at a very deep level. So uh, that's kind of the expectation we have with any of the softwares that we're vetting. Um, Rollworks is incredibly helpful. I'd say the lead, biggest leader in the pack by far is Kixi. Their support is fantastic. Uh, they've got a bit of that like aggressive salesperson mentality, but not from like the Zoom info style where they're attacking their sales energy towards you, they're using it to help you build more aggressive sales strategies, which is really cool. They're from Santa Monica, California. So they've got the just enough like umph 
to make them work, but also <laughs> shell it out for them not getting too too aggressive. Yeah. Um, all right. Do we do we have any more questions? Go ahead and throw it in the Q and A or the chat, and we can uh, get them answered. Oh, we got another one, William. We're right here. <laughs> you can just ask. <laughs> I love it. I'll come. Are up you here. running? No. Yeah. Please do. So your question is: Are you running ABM uh, for both your agency and for clients? And so, absolutely. So that's a big part of what we do is we try to be the shining example of. Um, all the different things that we do. And that, so the answer is yes. Um, the nurturing workflows, we can't like to keep it nice and simple. Um, staggering communication. We internally have a newsletter that we put out every week, kind of covers all, all arching aspects. And for those that are inquiring about ABM or any of our services, we use sales sequences um, with different stops and triggers. So that way, Will, we have one dedicated salesperson um, who's become incredibly efficient. So we, during the sales process, will identify certain properties that pertain to that particular user. And so that way, the communication stays drumming uh, that beat for them. Interesting. So you're relying more on the sequences than workflows to drive sales communications? Yes. Uh, I like that distinction. Are you, do you, are you on pro enterprise on the sales hub? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it gets, it's a, it comes into the inbox differently that way as well. Right. So yeah, the, the one to many you're already labeled as a promotional email. We do mm -hmm. not work with, um, startups for the most part, just say at all. Um, so we have the feature trigger for the at Gmail, the free email accounts still go through our contact mm -hmm. forms, which is great. Um, yes, definitely sales sequence is the way to go. Make sure not to add too many links, especially for the first few. And the goal of sales sequences is to elicit some sort of response. So even a no thank you or not now is a win. At least your message is resonating and it's not robotic enough to where they just hit the spam filter. We go do a, a copy workshop with Ginny, our director of content. Um, She's amazing. And so we help craft messages that resonate with your company, but also your customers. So it's, it's a human approach. Cool. Yeah. Good, good recommendation there. Those come from your Gmail account rather than HubSpot servers. So they, they just, they're, they're, they're different. They're treated differently. You don't want to send a hundred of them a day, but um, you know, but you, 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 you have uh, it, it just, yeah, it, it hits their inbox differently. It feels different. looks different. Yeah, it doesn't have all that all the fluff. So you get that one to one email. I mm -hmm. don't think the cap is 200. Our company cap when we're doing services for customers is we cap it at 50 per email address per user. So if you have five sales reps, that would be 250 can go out but 50 per email address per week. That way you're not um, messing with your domain sending score. Yeah, okay. You're, I'm a big fan of progress over perfection. So each week we like to recap our campaigns, what's working, what's not, um, you know, on each stage of each sequence as well. Nice. I like that idea. It's a good thing to do in a sales meeting. Yeah. But share, shared wins and shared losses. That tribal knowledge is invaluable. Can we flip to uh, LinkedIn? Yeah, please. So you had that as part of your stack um, up there you, and I think asked you know, how many people were, I, I can't remember the, the, quite the word, but um, I don't feel, I, we use it as a source of intel when we're doing research on a new prospect, um, not using it heavily for any kind of outbound um, What's, what are you finding this working for um, your clients and your agency in there? Well, if you're, if you're doing manufacturing and you're, you know, the buyer personas at your ICP are mm -hmm. C-suite executives and they're, they're living, living on LinkedIn and they're probably checking it a few times a week, I would take the same approach as we do with any of our copy-based uh, marketing, which is be human, 
Um, I think uh, HubSpot kicked off inbound this year in person by like, talking about, um, you know, I do business, you do business, we should do business together as being a LinkedIn outreach example. We help customers this way. If you need anything, let us know. Is pretty, so I, I'm probably skimming it down a little bit, but that's generally the outreach. We're here if you need us. At the same time, when you do that LinkedIn outreach, you're pairing it with the email and you're pairing it with ad placement on the person's computer. We've all had that, like, how do they get a hold of me in so many ways? Yeah. And this is the, this is the, my version of the HubSpot tech stack of friends that allow that to happen. Okay. Clear. Yeah, this is great. Great question. I was going to blow through this so quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think with these events, if I'm being honest, the discussion post is probably more useful for people um, because we're getting into more of the nitty gritty and uh, getting real examples and real questions out there. So, uh, William, thank you for, for asking all these great questions. If there's any more out there, uh, this is kind of your last call, I should say. Um, well, I'm happy to talk a little bit about yeah. the Apollo integrating with HubSpot. So yeah, that was, I kind of threw that out there. Um, curious how you guys use it integrated with HubSpot. Uh, we don't wants to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just really important to keep HubSpot to be your like true honest hub of genuine contacts. So yeah, we use, we do do some things to attract and engage pre being added to HubSpot. But once we've had a positive conversation, which includes we're not ready right now or we're not interested right now, our next question for that is, would it be okay if we followed up with you in a few months? And if they say yes, that's our trigger for <laughs> adding them to HubSpot and then we'll add them to a sequence that follows that. Um, essentially asking for permission for that gate key. Um, so this is really important. I see the the frustration getting overwhelmed so quickly when somebody downloads a contact sheet of 5,000 people, imports it into their HubSpot account, and then immediately blasts those at list. Such a uh, old school unempathetic tactic, and you destroy your domain server name server, which is just such a pain to reestablish. You obviously aren't going to get customers out of that transaction to begin with. And we've got to work for these, these contact conversations. They deserve it. Yeah. Great. Any more questions from anybody? I think, uh, William, you got any more questions? Maybe. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, go for of it. Of course I have more questions. I don't know if it's <laughs> on all the time here. No, I mean, we've got, we've got time, please. please. All right. Um, back to LinkedIn. Have you experimented with LinkedIn Live at all? The no, I have, have, have not. I'm still pretty new to putting my face on camera. It's something that uh, I was probed to do. Probed isn't the right word either. This is why I don't <laughs> do on camera stuff. Uh, but no, I have not. I'd imagine though, like knowing all the other platforms that LinkedIn's algorithm would especially for your first few broadcast it to your network and yeah. would be incredibly valuable. So follow me on LinkedIn and I may play with that in the next month. I, uh, I, William, I definitely will. We did quite a, we did quite a few um, in September, kind of, okay. kind of that test run. We did uh, I think three or four of them um, kind of really to kind of learn the quirks of it. And it's certainly a, it's certainly beneficial. Um, I think one of the things that people don't necessarily think about when they think of these types of events um, so Beacon's Point, we're content, we think of content. And so we, we kind of wanted to experiment with these. And one of the things we found, one, it takes a few different tools to go live. Like you don't just press live on LinkedIn and you're good. Um, okay. you need like a, you need like a streaming platform. There's some free ones out there. Story, maybe if you can throw some of the ones we used, um, in the chat. Nope. You're already on it. I think, um, <laughs> yeah, there's an article there to help. And you know, we, what we found out we did, we actually re treated them as a, as like a webinar or like a podcast. So we also have a podcast and we talked about the similar topics. We talked about it in similar ways. Um, you, it's harder to chat in real time with people that ask questions because there's a little bit of a delay uh, from when you, you are talking on LinkedIn from when 
uh, in reality you're talking. Um, okay. And so we, we found it pretty helpful to get good interaction with people. It just depends the topic and how much promotion you do. Um, I don't think we did enough promotion to make a bigger impact, but again, some of those like lessons we learned from that. Are the delays of doing that? Now I have questions. Yeah. Would you keep okay, doing it? Who, who first? <laughs> William first, of course. Okay. Are you, are you going to keep doing it? We keep trying. Uh, we will probably. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were kind of trying it a little bit of like a uh, little learning. Uh, yeah. Story, story is on, uh, on, on the Beacons Point team and helped market them. And I think we, we were like, okay, let's try doing one a week for, for September. And it was a little aggressive. And I think we did them too close together and we weren't able to promote them in time. Um, and so maybe like every two weeks, once a month to start, I think maybe would be a good, good reaction. Um, yeah. Like stories, adding some more context there. Um, yeah, thank you story. And you can do it through zoom. Uh, and no matter how much I followed the tutorials, I couldn't, we couldn't get it to actually go live. This, the camera didn't show up on the actual LinkedIn feed because we're paying for zoom already. We don't want to pay for a different yeah. service. Um, so I think it can be done and I think it's just, there's some quirks to it to get it to work properly. Did it trigger notifications to your audience? Did you do it from a personal account or did you do it from a company account? Uh, we did it from my personal because I have a bigger network. I thought it would have a, bi a bigger, like, inner, bigger uh, impact on it. Um, so it treats it as you create an event, and that event just happens to go live at a certain time versus uh, a lot, you know, like a, an event that you click over to a webinar that happens somewhere else. Um, so it essentially creates an event. Um, your your network does get pinged, but those people get more notifications that that like say they're going or or that are that are coming to them. Um, and so that's why I think kind of story mentioned, maybe doing them, um, stretching them out a little bit further. So just like webinars, you have time to say like, Hey, we're doing this thing, come to this thing. And we're going to learn about this. Um, it's going to be me, William and Chris. And we're talking about these three things, um, you know, have more time to, to promote them, to get people to attend. But I think, you know, one of the key things is like, what else can you do with it? So make sure you, you can like take snippets that go to social later, you can take, uh, it could be transcribed into an email, like the topic could be an email. Um, can it be an article later? Can it be, be repurposed into a podcast episode with just the audio? So it's not just, don't think just about the live, but also what other things you can do with it as well. Yeah, I completely agree about that. We learned that doing webinars during the <clears throat> pandemic and we couldn't do in-person events. Yeah. There's just so much you can repurpose once you get over seeing your face on video. But at this point, with all the Zoom meetings, I'm kind of over the adversity. Yeah, I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, it was keep your camera on or not. And now it's if you don't have your camera on, what are you doing? Stay safe. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> There's a no another shameless plug that's not on our tech stack for this is Quick Q U I C C. And that is a video library management tool. Um, so it helps create clips and the reusability of that library. It's very inexpensive. Q-U-I-C-C, -C, highly recommend. Alex, have you heard of that platform? Uh, I'm looking it up right now. There, there's drop, a lot of platforms. Drop all like your videos in. Up. Yeah. Right? They started with closed captioning software mm -hmm. and they do that kind of multi-language tra translation at a high degree. But the, uh, the video library management has become like an unsung hero of their tech stack. Cool. Yeah, I will say there is a time uh, that goes into somebody needs to then splice it up. Doesn't always yeah. have to take long, um, but we, we've used some other tools. Um, one was called Lately that, and this was probably a year ago, you two years ago, and it just like wasn't quite there. Um, take a video clip and it spit out like 20 Twitter posts, um, taking like little snippets of the video, but it just like, it just wasn't close enough. <laughs> like would it miss time, like half sentence type situation? Yeah. And it just picked things. So it could, it, it could have taken, uh, it could like cut your, your thought in half on accident without, and then it wouldn't make as much sense, but on paper so, it might, but not in the like nuance of how you say something. So, well, with all the AI happening with text to video and, yeah. and, and 
you know, back again, it'd be interesting to look at that one. Yeah. It's all getting better. I mean, it's I know getting, we, only, it is, we have a couple minutes left at the end of the hour. Do you want to plug your upcoming event? Oh, yeah. Your, yeah. If you don't mind, that, go to those. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you, we have a one sheet specifically on this. Um, if you're interested, reach out. It breaks down all the different tech stacks we've talked about. Almost all of them have some sort of deal or promotion uh, by working with the partner. So happy to connect you. And oh, there we go. I've got an upcoming event about sales strategy in 2023. It's November 10th. Host by user group on sales strategy. And then Alex is back. Yeah. Uh, we also run the San Diego HubSpot user group. So I don't know if I've got any San Diego locals in here, um, but we will be talking about, this will be a virtual event, but it's really the pitfalls when you integrate Salesforce and HubSpot. Um, as HubSpotters, we all probably would like to convince our clients to get off of Salesforce. Uh, but in a lot of situations that just doesn't make sense or it's just not going to happen. And you need to understand how to make the two work together nicely uh, there is a good native integration, but there's a lot that goes into that. And so we will be uh, we will be live again on November 8th at 11 a.m. Uh, and Brian Soraki, who is our pl director of platform operations, will be kind of presenting on this and answering all the questions. So I know this one's a little more technical, um, but it's a it's gonna be a great event. Uh, if you have any clients or if you yourself are integrating HubSpot and Salesforce, this is a great event. Uh, for you, because there's a lot to think about when you integrate. And I, I put the link in the chat. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I think we will be joining that one as well. William, I appreciate yeah. you uh, being a sore for so forthcoming on this recorded call. <laughs> you led the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Well, yeah, it's my pleasure. Fun. If you again, if I know that you are trying to place somebody internally, but happy to help in the the interim. Um, kind of a di different experience stack you'll need to find somebody to operate these things. So we'll 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 help you get that organized as well. Okay, well, I'll reach out and connect with you, and um, I'll definitely be bringing some ideas from this conversation back to my team. We'll figure out how we're going to move those forward. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, Good thank stuff. you, Chris, for, for presenting and joining us. Thank you, William, for your questions. And thanks for everybody who joined. We will, uh, you know, we, we might have another event in December, but I know December gets a little crazy for everybody. Uh, so we might just plan one for January, February. Uh, it's crazy that I just said that out loud. Um, we're, we're getting out of October, but thanks everybody for coming and look forward to the next ones. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Alex.